Welcome everyone to Dead Talk Live, and tonight we have a special guest, Dave Sheridan is with us, famously from Scary Movie. Dave, uh, thank you for being with us, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks for having me. It is, yeah, our, this is awesome. It is our pleasure, it is our pleasure to talk to you, get to talk about some stuff, and you know, before we get started on your stuff, uh, looking at your IMDB, you have a lot of stuff coming out. Out of all this stuff that is completed in post-production, which project are you most excited about? Mm, that's hard to say. You know my IMDb probably better than me. So, um, uh, hmm. I really like, you know, we're going to be screening um, a director's cut of Bloody Summer Camp at the New Jersey Horicon. And nice. that'll be like November 14th or something like that. So, I'm excited about that. That's a, that's a fun a fun little thing. And then um, a movie that's out that I just saw like a review on is called uh, Cold Blooded Killers. Uh -huh. And I got an opportunity to play the, the main bad guy in that, you know, like, and that's not a horror movie. That's more like a grindhouse shoot 'em up kind of Peck and Paul, you know, Tarantino, post Tarantino grindhouse kind of thing. Yeah. Rope housey. Uh, but it was a fun role for me because I got to play the, the actual main villain. Nice. And then, uh, I played a main villain in is called Massacre Academy, which is a it's kind of tongue in cheek and comedic. But my character is the masked clown character that's really brutal. And not, that that one is not a funny turn for me at all. You know, so yeah. so I kind of like that's a lot of people ask me why I went into sort of the like ultra low budget, low budget horror. Well, one is it's also survival. You know, you reach a certain age in the business and if if you're not that you know in a certain category where there's offers being made then there's very really little money so you might as well go and do what you want to do or at least go to a place where you can have freedom to explore new opportunities of characters and in the horror genre yeah uh, it's enabled me not to just play you know i'm not just a goofy deputy all the time now you know i can move on to the goofy you know the goofy neighbor or the goofy mayor <laughs> like in, in bloody summer camp i'm a sheriff so i moved up from a deputy to a sheriff and i, I have been cast in a mayor and a couple of things as well uh this movie called shadow marsh that's that, pretty cool and uh, i play the mayor in that one so it's kind of funny how i'm i'm moving my way up in the in the public service category you know that's awesome and you know you brought up the new jersey horror festival that's the one in atlantic city right Yes, that'll be uh, at the showboat in a, in Atlantic City. And I was just trying to think of one. I'm going to be there. You know, when this will air, but I was trying to think of something upcoming that would be pertinent. You know, I, I don't yeah. want to tell people. there. I'm doing Frightmare in the Falls at Niagara Falls, but that's this weekend, Halloween weekend. We shoot, you know, this isn't live. So mm -hmm. when does when does This is like live, that? actually. What? I didn't know it was live. I would have I would have not worn this uh, cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that talk. It, it rained here yesterday, and it's so beautiful out today. And I mean, it's, I like this clean weather. So my kids are home from school. This is this is really the quietest place I have is my backyard. Yeah, I hear you. I'm I'm I li <laughs> I have three teenagers and a wife, and I'm stuck in a little corner of the house. I've been pushed away from everywhere else. Right. Uh, exactly. But I look forward to meeting you at the uh, New Jersey Horror Festival. We're going to be covering that, so that should be pretty awesome. Yeah, that's the other reason I brought it up because I knew you were active over there in that area. So, and uh, this is uh, your movie is premiering on that Sunday at the end of the uh, convention. I think it's on Saturday, but I haven't seen the playlist on when it is. But okay, yeah. uh, we're gonna have to definitely check it out. Now, did you always have uh, sort of this comedic background? Yeah, all the time. In fact, uh, yeah, since preschool. You know, <laughs> I was the class clown and the troublemaker and the kid in the corner. You know, like when I was coming up and you're you're probably around the same age as me, they don't do it anymore. But I mean, I was like the last generation of the little dunce cap <laughs> in the corner and the rulers, which were like, you know, not 12 inch rulers, but yardsticks. You know what I'm saying? Yardsticks yeah. getting pounded on the table and getting spanked and stuff like that. And eventually then you go to the principal's office. So, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I was a I, I was a class clown myself. So I, I totally hear you on that. Uh, so let's go back and talk about scary movie. Uh, that is obviously what you're very well known for. It was a very popular film, a horror spoof comedy. 
that spoofed Scream, The Usual Suspects, and you yeah. ended up being, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, Kaiser, Kaiser Sose. Kaiser Sose <laughs> in the end. Uh, yeah. Tell us about that experience. How'd you get the role and what'd you think of it after it was all said and done with? Yeah. Also, the other movie was I Know What You Did Last Summer. Yes. Was like, you know, the two mashups. And that's the one thing that kind of separates, first of all, um, a lot of the spoofs that came after. And I mean, not just the scary movie versions, but all the other stuff. But ultimately, um, it really stayed true to at least those two movies. And it just kind of directly mashed them up. But the storyline, there was still a feasible storyline that you were yep. following. And um, it didn't give away who the killer was. No. Nope which we all know now at 20 i hope i hope there's not a spoiler alert for someone that the movie's been out for 20 years but <laughs> yeah spoilers are expired yeah so so you know I, I think uh when you watch the film there still is that kind of intrigue of oh, i wonder who the killer is you know as people get killed so because no matter what no matter how goofy a movie is if you have a plot that is still holding something back of a mystery of a, of a thriller then it, you know you have something interesting there and so i think that is on top of it being really funny, it, that's sort of what holds that movie out more than all the other scary movies and stuff like that and, and all the other spoofs. So that I knew that going into it, that that was going to be cool. You know, like, OK, wait, this isn't a horror movie, but there is killings and you it is Ghostface. It's just another version of Ghostface. And it's and uh, I think it's pretty unique. In fact, the interesting thing about that is so really quick, because you asked how I got involved with it was. I already was making films with the Weinstein company, uh, you know, Miramax and Dimension. And so they, they were aware of me. And back then, I used to shoot a bunch of – I, I shot a whole bunch of short films in, uh, in like 1990, 1991 that ended up on VHS tapes mm -hmm. and floating around. And one of the characters that was on there was a character named Chip. And I shot two short films with him. Chip is what turned into Doofy. Gotcha. Um, so – called chip and said hey he'd be that would be the perfect character and dave would if you could play chip as doofy that would be great and so um that's what i did you know and i i i thought that was awesome because i didn't have any plans to make chip into anything more than what it was yeah uh, but it's based on an amalgamation of like characters like people i knew in my neighborhood growing up I, I took three characters well i call them characters but they were they were characters in my neighborhood but they were real people and it was bruce adam and this guy named tony radio and i sort of mixed them together and had this chip short two short films about chip and they saw them and moved them into doofy but when i read the script and i saw that doofy was going to also be the killer i was like this might be my only shot to get inside a mask and stab people so <laughs> i said i'll do it if i get to play the killer because normally they would just put a stunt guy in there but i convinced them i and i think it was rightfully so i said there's a lot of physical humor that this ghost face is going to have, you know, not knowing how to hide and just all the different double takes. And, you know, it's hard to make a character with no face funny. You know what I mean? Yeah. You had to, it's all about the body movements and exaggerations of the neck and the head and stuff like that. So um, I had a lot of fun. I think it was equal amount of fun playing the killer in the movie. So you know, you, so, so you were actually the one behind the mask. That, that was you. Yeah. Yeah, and I got to keep the masks. I, I have the real, you know, the masks I wore, the robe I wore, the knives, or knife. Um, so That's I have good. That. I mean, you know how hard it is to actually walk away a set, from a set with that kind of memorabilia? Yeah, it, you know, and then we, we actually did a digital scan, like a laser scan of my masks to make a mold, a reverse mold with like a 3D printer so that we have a mold now to do latex. And I've done some hand pours and hand painted, but... I need to find a place to sort of, they're so popular, I can't even keep up. Like when I came to Pennsylvania HorrorCon, I, I hand painted 10 and I sold them on the Friday right away in the first two hours. And then Saturday, a guy was like, do you have any more of those masks? I go, I sold out on Friday. He goes, why didn't you save some for Saturday? I go, that's not the way it works. When I, when I pack something to sell, I sell it. It's not like I'm going five on, I don't know what's going to sell, what's not going to sell. Exactly. But, first come, first serve. Now, yeah, much? but. Ultimately, that's a lot of work for me to hand pour it and then hand paint them. So I, I'm looking for a place to maybe, you know, do a mass run of them because they don't exist. My scary movie, Ghostface, the, even the hero mask, 
it's different than all the other screams. And if you if you go back and watch the movie, the first time you see me standing outside in a kind of Michael Myers way out by the tree where she reads the note, I know what you did last summer, and then she looks and I'm gone. That is closer to the real scream mask. And that was the original um, sort of hand um, carving of what we were going to do. But then when I shot the scene with Carmen Electra, Keenan couldn't hear me. And I was doing the voice live. All that in the movie, most of that's all live, me recorded on set because I'm improvising and stuff. And so that's when they cut the mouth out and they did fabric. But when you cut the mouth out, it, it lost like the elongation of it and yeah. it became more rounder. And plus I tied it really tight because I didn't want it to flop around when I was moving. So that way they, the microphone and the boom mic could hear what I was saying yeah. so that Enon could hear it in, in his ears. And so um, it changed the shape of the, of the mask by but, doing that. But yeah, it's not very noticeable. I mean, huh? it's not noticeable. It is a little bit. I have a rounder mouth than the other screen ones because it's pulled and it loses its. It lost it. the moment you cut something it was yeah. like this and you you open it up, then it then it oh, it goes wider. You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, but that's great because that's what makes it unique. And there's been guys trying to hand make those, but they haven't nailed it because they just don't have the actual mask. But I was able to laser copy it, so I actually have the original mask that is the absolute duplicate of it and the that, same thing with the top. so yeah that, that is so cool in your opinion how hard is it to pull off a successful horror spoof like how did okay. the weigh-ins do i mean you know obviously they did great how was it working with them what did they do to make that such a success okay so in a, another case in point is we also did haunted house and haunted house 2 mm -hmm. and about to do another one in a couple of weeks. We're going to shoot something in Atlanta. I can't give it away. Um, the working title, though, I can tell that because I know it's going to change. It's called Boo. It's okay. the working. Um, and uh, it's a really cool thing. It takes place on Halloween night. That's all I got to say about it. It's one night. But it's not a spoof. That one is an original idea. Okay. But it is. It's more like Jumanji and, uh, uh, you know, um, as soon as, as soon as you said Halloween night, I'm like, oh, they're going to spoof Halloween, the movie, Michael Myers. <laughs> no, but there, there is aspects to that trick-or-treating, you know, boogeyman trick-or-treating stuff, you know, but it's not a Michael Myers directly spoof. But uh, ultimately, though, you go back to, like, how did they make Scary Movie so funny or what's the secret of a horror spoof? The secret of any spoof and what Keenan would always say is you have to have uh, the audience has to know what you're spoofing. They have to know the, the tropes and the sort of stereotypes and the cliches. And so that's why doing a film, making fun of a genre or a film that's played out or at least is so familiar that so many people understand it. Mm -hmm. So even if you look at Scary Movie, there really is um, Halloween stuff in there and uh, Friday the 13th because it's the typical stuff of the car not starting or how do I escape from here? Like the girl trying to crawl through the doggy door, you know what yeah, I mean? And, yeah. and and while she's stuck, then I, I turn on the uh, garage door, you know, and cut her body in half or whatever. So it's like um, th there's some of that stuff that's not wasn't in Scream, but everyone understands the slow walking killer. You know, yeah, I do a thing, the slow walking killer, where she's running, Carmen Electra's running, and I'm still I'm catching up to her. And then it reveals she's on a treadmill. You know what I mean? So like <laughs> we, I just watched Halloween Kills and they do that exact same thing. They don't do the treadmill, but there's a woman running. Through the woods. And Michael Myers, and he, nice slow pace. Nice slow pace. It's like the, the rabbit in the hair or whatever. Like he, he, he still, he got to the same place as her, well rested, and he was listening for her heavy breathing. You know, <laughs> she ran and he walked, you know, and he, he's quiet listening around. So, um, did yeah. you have to see that one? Did you see the Halloween kills yet? I have. I saw it on opening night. I. It was, I feel, I felt like they tried to bite off way too much with all the characters and the tying. You know, it's pretty. You, yeah, you and I are in an agreement. I was not really satisfied with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, uh, it was all over the place. It was fragmented. And right. what happened was, you know, we sort of came to expect uh, with, you know, starting with Halloween 5 and on that the level of the movies have gone down. And then in 2018, they give us this amazing Halloween movie. 
Right. And it just boosted enthusiasm for everybody. And everybody was waiting for Halloween Kills to come out. And it's mixed. I mean, nobody... I haven't spoken to anybody who... I mean, not really... I mean, there are also a few people on the internet that just, oh my God, we loved it. But 90% of the people I've spoken to were like, eh, I'm neither here nor there. I neither hated it nor loved it. For right. me, I was disappointed. Yeah, I, w I was disappointed in the fact that, to me, the biggest disappointment was the filmmakers involved are veteran filmmakers. So they understand how to craft a good story. They understand how to shoot a good movie the producers are the top producers in the horror business so for them to put up uh i'm, I'm not going to call it diarrhea but it was just sort of like a macaroni collage of mm -hmm. too much stuff there was just too many too yep. many characters going on too many like flashbacks to you know who this person is and this person this person remember this versus like yeah uh, it left off the original like the 18 one left off with him looking up with that flame and it's the first time you ever saw like this little lost puppy dog yeah of mike you know this lifeless face all of a sudden became sad looking up and it was like i want to see what is his connection to you know the um the you know uh, jamie lee Kirk character you know what i'm saying exactly and she had she had very little to do i thought she was in a dan and having um oh yeah um, she didn't need to be in this movie yeah it looked like they just cut in like um clips of her like having like uh irritable bowel syndrome from eating dan yogurt commercials you know what i mean because she was like oh oh like holding her stomach the whole time i was just you could put fart sounds in probably and you know and this that whole movie they were trying to build up to the finale where supposedly we're going to find out what makes michael tick and all the information they gave us is that he just when he was a kid before he killed his sister just looked out the window that's all the information they gave us. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it was supposed to be, this is the penultimate uh, movie to what is supposedly going to be the finale. And they didn't, right. they didn't just give us anything besides him looking out the window. Now, let me ask you this. Now, John Carpenter had a much more hands-on role in 2018 than he did in this one. You think that played a big factor? I Yeah, probably. He probably kept it. You know, look, it, look, in 2018, they really tried to do a, I felt like they mimicked the first one, you know, like very simple, yeah. a simple premise of uh, Michael Myers, except for him. Once you got past him escaping, then it was basically, I'm tracking this girl down. And then, and then it went to that safe house yeah. where the stakes were upped. And I thought it would then continue that in some way, you know, like where, you know, how's he, I didn't mind like. Like, say, remember the firemen when they were fight when he was fighting the firemen, mm -hmm. which you never really saw Michael Myers take on, you know, he was a Jackie in a Jackie Chan martial arts style no. kicking. But I didn't mind that. That was like at least like, OK, great. And I love the little stuff where the woman was shooting and he kicked the door and the gun shot her in the head. You know, like uh, I was actually expecting him at the top of the stairs <clears throat> to pick the gun up in his house. Remember when the guy had the yeah. gun, the and I was expecting him to pick the gun up and shoot her at the bottom of the stairs going, I've never seen Michael Myers pick a gun up and no. just shoot something, which would have been hilarious that he just finally did it. Like, yeah. I can shoot you. I just don't like doing it. You know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, thinking of it, that would have been great. That would have been something different. And you're right about the characters. Uh, bringing back Tommy Doyle, and this is nothing on Anthony Michael Hall. Anthony Michael Hall is a good actor. But just bringing back the character of Tommy Doyle, why? I mean, it right. served no purpose. Uh, Lindsay, uh, Nurse right. Crane, I don't know. It was just, like you said, too many characters, too much stuff going on here and there. And then they put in that social commentary in the hospital where uh, you yeah, had, yeah, yeah right. you know, where the guy who, the patient who was innocent, who jumped off right. the edge, was like yep. sort of a representation of America today, divided, right. and he fell yeah. off the cliff. Uh, well, it showed the mob mentality where they were like, "We're gonna, we're 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 gonna, we're killing the evil," but they became the mob. They became the evil mob. It's the Frankenstein thing, you know what I yeah. mean? Like Frank, uh, the whole thing. You're the monster, but the town is the monster against Frankenstein. All of a sudden, they become the monster, the mob, mob, you know, group thinking. Yeah literally killed an innocent guy you know exactly I mean? so, 
and you felt so bad for him because he was just scared. He went to the hospital to turn himself in, find some help. And at right. the end, he was so scared, they literally drove him off the cliff. Right. Uh, now, <laughs> now going back to uh, Scary Movie, did you have, uh, did you talk to, like, David Arquette, who played your counterpart in Scream or any of the other actors from any of the movies? Nope. Uh, no, no, I didn't. Um, in fact, I, it was years before I met David Arquette, even though when I moved to LA, I actually, um, lived next door to his family's home where his mom lived and his, uh, sister Alexa lived. And, um, so I would see him before I even did. I mean, this was like for five, six years before I got cast in scary movie, I would see David and stuff like that. I never said hi to him or anything. And, um, cause you know, you, you respect people's privacy, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And family, so it's not like I'm like, what's up, you know? So, um, but when I did meet him, he it was a movie he directed a movie called Tripper. I don't, I don't know if you know that movie. It's pretty good. It's pretty good little slasher. I film. haven't seen it, but I have heard of it. It's pretty good, man. Paul Rubens is great in it. The Pee Wee Herman, uh, Mr. Pee Wee Herman, and um, so I I was invited to the premiere red carpet, and David was greeting everybody on the red carpet in this kind of white suit splattered in blood. It was his writing and directing debut. And um, as I walk up to shake his hand, and I'll see if I the camera, but there it is. I'm like, hey, how you doing? I'm, before I even got my name out, I go, I'm, and he goes, I know who you are. I know who you are. You know, and he was just kind of gripping my hand. I'm like, uh-huh, mm-hmm, I know who you are. And it was like, I think he took the doofy performance like he kind of did take it as a jab at him no, when it wasn't because no, no. if he would understand, if he saw the two short films that I played a chip, all I did was literally play the character I was already doing. They, they said, this would be great for a doofy, but you know, like it was a spoof of Dewey, but my character, I wasn't like, how am I going to rip him? You know what no, I mean? Like no, I, was no, kind yeah. of- I didn't see that at all. Now, you know, there's a new screen movie coming out and I believe yeah. David, uh, directed this uh, new one, the new screen movie. Um, what are your expectations for that? I don't have any. Um, I just hope it's not the typical reboot, and it's the kids. They're at their parents now, and now it's kids. I, I think that would be. We've seen that. You know yeah. what I mean? Like the older generation. It's, in fact, it's similar to like what we just saw in Halloween, where mm-hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis' is the grandmother and Judy Greer is the mom, and the main girl is in high school or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like um, that one, that one makes more sense because the Michael Myers thing is a bloodline. There's something about her family that that's my thing is like, we, what's the relationship there uh, with uh, her family. But um, in scream, scream was never that there's not a bloodline in, in scream. You so know you I mean? wanted to be brought back to the main characters like Neve Campbell, Courtney Cox, David Arquette, and right. not have it be their kids. And whatnot. right. But, but we know the reasoning is because movies and these these slasher movies are teen movies. They're they're date night movies. They're yeah. they're ghost jumps and you know like scares and stuff to get the girl to go or the the guy to go like that and get closer. Or, you know what I mean? Whatever it is, it's like it's kind of like a roller coaster ride. You go on a roller coaster to have a little thrill, and you go in these things to get a little thrill. And um, I, it's hard to thrill a fifty two year old. You know what I'm saying? Watching another fifty two year old like run around, and I don't know if we want to see, uh, you know half naked 52 year olds versus <laughs> you know 18 year olds so um it's hard to say but i i get it that's you know the youth the youth market is where the market is oh yeah it's product. always been like that it's always been right. like that now uh i'm noticing a trend of the slasher movies slowly slowly starting you know coming to come slowly coming back of course in the 80s it was all the rage with the Jason Voorhees, the Michael Myers, the Freddy Kruegers into the 90s. And then slasher movies sort of really disappeared. Uh, right. now, the big horror attraction right now and the big, you know, draw are supernatural paranormal movies. That's what right. scares people. In fact, that's the last subgenre of horror that actually still scares me because I kind of believe in it. Uh, right. What are your feelings about... <laughs> Thing, not to stop you, but it's the one plausible. Yeah, you know, because it's an unknown. 
you know, and I did have, I had a, I had a, I went on a ghost hunt in a, in a haunted hotel that was like 300 years or 250 years old and had a big history. And, um, at this last convention I just did, it was a Lexington scare fest. I was near a panel and it was a panel of ghost hunters or demon demonologists and stuff. And they started talking about the, the possessions and what happens. And, um, when I, I, I feel like I had a brief possession of a demon that I went into a catatonic state where I couldn't wow. move and half my face drooped like a sort of like partial paralysis and stuff. And all I could move was my eyes. And it wasn't until this, like somebody else on the crew figured out, wait, he's blinking. Are you blinking Morse code? And I started blinking. I didn't know Morse code, but I was trying to signal them that I am there, but I couldn't move my body at all. Wow. And, and I, I thought it was only out for like a minute. They rolled tape on everything. And it wasn't until we got back to the hotel and I was out of it the rest of the night. Like I was very like, you know, uh, like I had a concussion type of thing. Yeah. You know, I like just knocked out. And um, I said, man, that, that was a crazy mi- How long was that? Like a minute, two minutes? And they go, no, you were, you were, you were catatonic for 15 minutes. We had the tape. Sure. And I didn't know that. I thought it was only, that's when I got pissed off at them. I was back at the hotel. I'm like, what? And I started like, re- I was ready to try to punch people because I was like, you had me like that for 15 minutes and you didn't call 911. What if it was like a diabetic seizures? I or you're having know. a stroke or something. That's what I'm saying. I was like, why? I thought it was just out a minute. And by the time you guys got your senses, we're like, oh, he's back. We were going to, we were going to call 911. But then I realized, and the reason they didn't want to call 911 is because I don't think they had permits to go inside this uh, closed hotel and stuff like that. You know what so I mean? So like, their, their option was to let you die if you were having a medical emergency? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if that's any better, right? Because it's sort of like if you don't have insurance, you don't have a permit. Well, you're you're. It could be worse if I die. <laughs> exactly, but yeah, paranormal, supernatural movies. Uh, you know, I read a study a couple of years ago. Over sixty percent of the world's population believes that there is something after death. Okay, right. now the beliefs vary, but for me, I've never experienced anything paranormal. But I'm a 100% believer. I don't want to experience it, to believe it. I know something exists after death. And the movie in Hollywood has just, you know, taken off. Yeah, they do severe exaggerations with the dramatizations. But at the end of the day, when we go to the movies, we want to be entertained. And we want to be scared, hence all the dramatizations. Now, going back to the slasher flicks, uh, are you also noticing... a a slight uptick in slasher flicks over the last several years? Well, definitely on the independent circuit, there's a lot more slasher flicks. And I feel like they've all also trying to sort of go, we're in the eighties, you know what I mean? Or we're in the nineties. So it's sort of these sort of period piece slasher flicks only because it on a lower budget, it makes it at least look like there's some sort of like take or production value to it. Yeah. I'm like, that massacre academy takes place in the 80s and so does the um the one i'm gonna the one that's playing at uh, new jersey Horicon. it's called bloody summer camp it's like an 80s summer camp yeah. you know blood flasher type of thing um i think i'm good with that because it's simple stuff and it you know for for a while they went with the zombies the zombies were the big thing oh yeah and you think that zombies could be like oh that's sort of cheap but you know you need zombies you need bodies so that, that, you know, and there's a lot of makeup to do on that. And we did a movie, we did a spoof. I did a spoof of The Walking Dead called The Walking Deceased. Yeah. In, um, and we shot it in um, San Antonio, Texas. This was in 2015. It was like after the, it was like two seasons of The Walking Dead were mm-hmm. on already. Um, so it didn't spoof all the characters. It was really the main core of that first season. Mm-hmm. And um, I played the sheriff and I kept looking for my son, you know, coral, And uh, it was funny. I had a ball, but we didn't have a lot of money. And I remember looking at the reviews going like, oh, it could have been funnier. They could have did so much more. And I was like, I know we couldn't have done more because more costs more money. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? You want bigger uh, sight gags. If you want zombies coming, crashing through a wall, well, that's that costs money. You know, and, but with that one, there was a lot of those zombie walks and zombie groups. And you could we went on Facebook and just said, show up at the mall already made up you know so they only had to make five or six hero zombies and the rest were just people that 
you know, hey, I'm, I made myself up as a zombie. And then like, that's kind of how we had a horde of 50 or 60 was people just showed up to be in the movie. That's, already a great, made that's a great way to bring in zombies. Say, you know, come in all dressed up and be a part of our movie. That's, yeah, exactly. that's, that's pretty brilliant. And you got to say with, with zombies, uh, of course, Romero is the granddaddy of all zombies. Absolutely. Uh, and then, you know, that also went into a lull. And it was The Walking Dead back in 2010 that really revitalized the zombie genre. Right, right. And everybody started to try to cash in on the same success. Films. Uh, I mean, there's a brand new television show that's actually pretty good uh, called Day of the Dead. That It's only two episodes in. It's a, oh. it's a very light. It's on the sci-fi channel. And it's okay. a very, it's not like the Day of the, Romero's Day of the Dead. It's very lighthearted, comedy-like uh, zombie film where, you know, it goes against the typical zombie tropes where if a hand gets severed, the hand is going to move on its own, you know? So they take a very lighthearted approach, and so far it's, it's working. But, you know, zombies, like I said, it's just another example. Before The Walking Dead came onto the scene, there were... It's not like zombie fans disappeared. They wanted the zombie stuff, but nothing right. of quality was coming out until The Walking Dead came out. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like, I I did a film called The Special, changing the subject, but it is genre. I'm just jumping to different genres. Um, it was a monster movie. You know, it was like a, a Cronenberg fly kind of a mm -hmm. creature feature movie of a, of a guy that uh, has been infected and he's transforming yeah. so at, at, at the end of the movie he's sort of grotesque and he's a monster and and um again it's a different genre so it's it's not like any of these things are like oh i don't want to watch that anymore you know i remember um in this is in the comedy it was uh, it was a will ferrell basketball movie i forget what it was called but I, when i was working with the studios and i forget what we were trying to get off the ground and his his basketball film didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, sports comedies aren't playing right now. And I was like, well, everything plays, but bad sports comedy might not be popular, but that doesn't mean a good sports comedy wouldn't do well. You know what I'm saying? It's exactly. like, a, got so a, a good slash, a good take on a slasher movie is a good movie. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A bad take on a slasher movie is a bad movie. So yeah. a bad zombie movie is a bad zombie movie. So um, it all comes down to the individual project. If you have a good script and if you have the right people in place, you can right. take anything and it's going to be good. You know, now going just touching back on scary movie again, in regards to your career, playing the character of Doofy, uh, did it give your career a boost right after that came out? Uh, looking yeah. back, do you have any regrets to taking on that role? Do you think it kind of pigeonholed you into a certain type of character? What are your thoughts looking back on that film right now? Oh, no. It was, it was, you know, that was definitely a key to whatever career I had. You know what I mean? Um, so I'm very thankful. In fact, I, I, I coached my son's Little League uh, game. So this was 21 years ago right now, this film. And I was at the batting cages today with my son and I was reserving another cage for tomorrow for the whole team. And the guy, Zach, behind the countertop, he's like, I finally figured out who you are. I, I finally recognized you. And I was like, oh, oh, what's that? And he goes, you're in one of my favorite movies. And I was waiting to see what that was because I get different things. I got Devil's Rejects just yesterday from that, somebody else. We're going to get to that next. Yeah. <laughs> This one, I was ready for him to say something else. And he said, scary movie, which is probably the bigger of it all. Everyone knows. And he knew me as Doofy. Well, now, what's funny is I've been going to this batting cage with my baseball teams for like five, six years. So it took a while for this guy to figure me out. And I think it was because of I'm paying with credit cards. So he knows my name. Yeah. And uh, so I think whispers went like, oh, I because I just went to the For the Love of Horror in England. And I was gone for 10 days. So I think... Uh, one of the other coaches was using my membership for the team and said, oh, he's over doing a autograph signing in England. And that's when they were like, what do you mean? What does he do? So exactly. uh, I don't really like to, you know, 
I, the good thing about my career is I can I have a level of anonymity, you know, because all these people, the characters I play or the films I've been in, I don't always look like myself. Exactly, like and, Doofy. You know, I mean, I can I'm looking at you now, and I don't see well, you know. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't see Doofy. I right. see Dave Sheridan. Well, and what's funny is when someone does recognize me very quickly, like a host at a restaurant seating us, she's like, you know, I, I remember this happens every now and then. Like, you look so familiar. Did you play Doofy in Scary Movie? Right. Or I, it happens in the elevator sometimes. And I'm just like, that, they either have a very good eye or was I like looking at the elevator button going, you do anyway, good. Yeah. <laughs> my finger, you know. I'm like, was I standing there at the restaurant being like, yeah, what a cable? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sorry, it's like I'm, I'm all over the place. I'm trying to move my, I'm hand holding this. So it's like, sometimes I move it this way and that way. It's Hopefully it's not the jitter. It's okay. We're, we'll call this a found footage interview. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, so devil's but, rejects. But to go back to your question. Without a doubt, scary movie being like uh, one of the top grossing comedies ever. And having the longevity that it's had 20 years going on 20 years strong people are still watching it or discovering it and um the one thing about doofy was that he um he became a meme mm -hmm. he became a gif and a meme and he became political like there's he, or or this is this is me to my boss on monday you know what i mean me showing up to work on monday whatever whatever it is he's the new like hang in there friday's almost there the kittens it's like now doofy is that you know what i'm saying and uh um how does that make you feel that the character that you played is still relevant and being used and popular today all that, these years later I'm pleased by it i'm thankful and and um and i take it i do take it sort of even though it's completely goofy i do take it serious i uh, a friend of mine, Felissa Rose, who's like one of my producing partners, we've done a lot of movies with. She's a great her person. Film, yeah. Her biggest film is uh, Sleepaway uh, Camp. When she was 13 years old, and you know now she's 30. She's 33, I think. I'm, <laughs> and so, uh, but basically, um, the thing with Felissa is she's she showed me how you need to be grateful for the fact that you're given that one role. You know what I mean? Not mm -hmm. al not alone. I played 77 roles, you know, and there's other characters that are are very popular that I've played as well, but nothing like Doofy. And it's it's interesting. It was my first one out of the gate. Yeah. Uh, but a role makes the actor at the end of the day. And yeah. um, the, since the fans like him so much, you know, at first I was like, I didn't want to embrace doing Doofy at like the conventions and stuff. But now I understand how it touches people and there's, it makes people laugh and smile and exactly. that's what I'm, let me get you, know, you, you said, class clown since preschool i can't do anything else if, exactly if I, yeah i wouldn't know how to do it you and know, you, so. you mentioned felissa rose this i met her this past may at a convention and this right. was a small convention in north carolina but yep. it had some pretty big people ross marquand from the walking dead was there yep. Uh, yep. a lot of big people she was by far the most popular person there. She always had a line. Yep. Uh, she just attracts the people, you know, sleepaway camp. She's very active in producing and behind the camera right now. And while she was signing autographs, this is after I met her, her manager was right there with her as well. And uh, her manager's name is Sam, I believe. Yep. And we got to talking yep. And I asked, you know, uh, wow, Felissa, for being known from Sleepaway Camp, is really popular. And Sam filled me in. You know, Felissa is always producing. She's been active in this industry well beyond Sleepaway Camp, uh, doing horror and producing and whatnot. Yeah. Well, I mean, and Felissa is a different story. She's the most unique on the circuit. Trust me, I tour with her all the time. I was supposed to be at that one. And I had an opportunity to go to the camp. I don't know if you know the camp at all, because I know yeah. you're a Walking Dead fan. Yeah. The the camp takes is is in where around the sets of the Walking Dead, and they do oh, tours. Yeah. And so, like you know, um, like Ross would be there one year. He wasn't there this year because he was at your thing that you're at. But Lou Temple would be there. Um, the the uh, Cameron or whatever, who who's the kid? Cam Cameron who plays the the main kid? Um, Chandler Riggs. Chandler, yeah, yeah, like 
they'll all be there and they'll they'll be a part of the tour to take people on like you know a bus tour and stuff like that and it's a charity event called the camp and it was the same weekend and i was double booked i didn't realize it but that, because that was that weekend it was a uh, north carolina fear fest or north carolina something yeah um, it was in raleigh yeah yeah and uh carolina fear fest i think it was called um but they played the um bloody summer camp at that mm-hmm. one too but it was a shorter version the one that's in new jersey is going to be the director's cut which has a little more stuff in it nice so. how uh i mean how do you enjoy conventions uh do you get a big kick out of them do you enjoy meeting the fans interacting with them uh yep. you know tell us how you personally experience each convention and how do you take it in i it, it's great. It's it, it's a symbiotic relationship because, um, you know, I bet you the fans probably think that they're getting the most out of it, you know, because it's like, oh, I got to meet Dave Sheridan and he signed a thing and he took a photo and did Doofy. But first of all, um, and one of the reasons I was always doing comedy is because obviously I'm looking for some sort of, uh, I wouldn't say admiration, but um, initial sort of uh, like reaction. Mm-hmm. Um in, when I would I went to Second City Theater, you know, and did comedy at Second City in Chicago. And when you're doing comedy on stage, people are laughing, so you know you're doing it right yeah. when you get that. When and then I went and did Steppenwolf too, which is like where John Malkovich and Gary Sinise and Gary Cole and stuff. And um, in that situation, when you're doing drama, you don't know. It, it's hard to read the audience. Are they buying into the play? Mm-hmm. There's no. There's no litmus, you know, marks of that beat work, that beat work. I would say, though, when you do drama in a live theater thing, when it hits these moments, it's the opposite. You feel this energy suck from the stage as if everyone collectively is holding their breath. Mm -hmm. And you kind of feel it pull away. You feel this like everyone, you know, and you feel it like, wow, I nailed it, you know. So you can do it, but the immediate gratification of the reaction of a young performer. It helps a young performer, like learning how to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not riding a bike when you fall, (laughs) you know, it's like, Oh, I didn't do it right. When you're able to stay on the bike, well, you know, you're riding a bike and that's kind of comedy really helps you understand how to control the beats and how to control the energy and timing. And it's the same as drama anyway. Uh, All performing is the same, but to somebody, you know, for me, it was easier to do, but it's the same thing when, I go to these conventions. I, you, when you're just in movies and TV shows, you don't know. Are am I connecting with people? Are people liking what I'm doing? But then when you go to do the, the festivals, people come up and tell you what they liked or what they didn't like, or, and you know how much they loved that thing, or how many times they watched Scary Movie or Ghost World or Sex Drive or whatever the film is. You know, like we were talking about uh, Devil's Rejects and stuff yeah. like that. And that's one aspect. And the other aspect is some people you really touch a lot. You know, some people are, you know, needed to be cheered up. They'll tell you a story of something that happened in their life that, but then I watched your movie the other night and it it got me through that or something like that. So there are, there's great moments with fans in that regard. Um, And, and they give you, like I said, market research, you know, you kind of know in the horror department, like what's what's I asked them about other films is what I'm saying. Well, what did you watch it? Like Halloween kills. Like, Oh, weekend i'll be at the frightmare at the falls and i'm certainly going to bring up uh, films that are relevant right now Mm -hmm. and hear what the fans are thinking about it because we know that halloween is within the horror community between you know between uh uh, friday the 13th and halloween those are the top two like you don't mess you don't say anything bad about michael myers you know what i mean so i'm curious to see what they'll what they thought of it you know because eventually you know, even the even the most hardcore fans have to be able to say, I didn't like that one so much, you know, yeah. but on the other hand, even the most hardcore fans usually say, I didn't like that, you know, it's <laughs> so. Exactly. Uh, now, right. I want to talk a little bit more about The Devil's Rejects, okay? You yeah. got to work with Rob Zombie. Uh, I believe I've read that you've stated you'd prefer projects like The Devil's Rejects over Scary Movie because of a desire to do more original content. What exactly yeah. did you mean by that when you when you said that? 
Well, I mean, just just the fact that like Scary Movie was a spoof of something that already existed, you know, and um, with Devil's Rejects, it was something coming out of Rob's head. You know, it was a completely, you know, he created the characters, he created the story. And also, I think more um, original content is just sort of like from a filmmaker's point of view, you know, yeah. like Rob was definitely the first or tour that I worked with who wrote it, directed it, pretty much edited it. I know there was a Glenn edited it, but he, he's sitting, Rob is sitting there saying, cut it here, move it there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, And Rob, obviously, you know, he's a musician. So like a John Carpenter, he's got a major hand into the score and the music of it all. So what um, were your, uh, feelings work is you know when you got on the devil's reject set was that the first time you ever met rob no i met him in my second interview you know like i did audition for that role mm -hmm. then i met him in the like an it wasn't an audition but it was a sit-down interview and then we did a table read so um the the day he called action on set i probably met him uh probably four times because i think he had a barbecue in his backyard um with everybody hold on i'm gonna let my dog out That's um good. which i'll tell you the funny thing on that was uh i never met bill mosley until the barbecue wow. and bill oh, i gotta let my other dog out <laughs> every time one goes out this other one he's cute she? right there, yeah. but she's got to come out now now they're gonna fight <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That is hysterical. So, so you know, you know Bill Mosley. He's yeah. intense, especially in Devil's Rejects. It's, it's, you know, I mean, he. If it, it's a shame they didn't, you know, films like that don't really get considered for nominations on things because <laughs> Bill Mosley's role, you know, mm -hmm. his performance definitely up there in terms of a performance. And um, so he, he shaved his head. Because that's a wig that he's wearing, the long hair. Mm -hmm. So in order to make it easier to like, hey, on and off, he just had his head shaved so they could put the wig on. But that was his real beard. So you have to you have the picture of Bill Mosley with a shaved head, but a giant lumberjack beard, and it was gray. And he's wearing like cut off jeans, and he's in Rob's pool, and he's floating in Rob's pool all by himself. He literally kept to himself. And I was like, well, who the hell's that? And he's like, oh, that's Bill Mosley. And I was, I was like, okay, I've never met him, but. It, he was already intense in a weird way, you know what I'm saying? But it wasn't a, it wasn't a off-putting, scary way. It was yeah. just kind of like, who's the, who's the crazy old guy with the beard and the psycho in the pool? You yeah, know? he like, was like in character or something. He was, but I think he just wanted. I think he was enjoying the pool. <laughs> you know, it might have been like, whoa, he's he needs to be alone. He's in the character, but nobody else wanted to get in the pool. Really, it's a barbecue, and it was like, I didn't, I didn't know there was going to be a pool. I, I just. And I don't have an extra pair of pants. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so. So, you know, I got to say, from my personal standpoint, House of a Thousand Corpses, The Devil's Rejects, are up there on some of the greatest horror movies uh, made. Rob, uh, completely original content. It was disturbing. Right. It was, it was unique. It was rich. What did you think from a fan standpoint, not actually being in the devil's rejects, but what were your feelings on those two movies watching them as a fan? I like both of them. Um, the only thing I would say is they really are so different, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, the hardest thing for me on a house of a thousand corpses, I know that Rob felt like he lost a certain amount of control and was like, I didn't get to complete my vision which is really why he set off to do the devil's rejects as a kind of like such a jar. There's, there is a difference in tone yeah. in those things. And I never even asked him is the tone of the devil's rejects, what you wanted the tone of a thousand corpses be because that wouldn't fit at all. Because mm -hmm. what I liked about a thousand corpses is house of a thousand corpses. It kind of had that old school fun house, yeah. you know, it, it felt, um, it was exaggerated in parts, you know what I'm saying? And that kind of, you know how those fun houses have those mirrors that like yeah. bend and your body. And that's what he, it felt like to me. He took me on that ride of these teens going on, you know, on this road trip and stepping into shit, you know, which 
which was right. like you know that kind of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Exactly, kind of, the Sawyer uh, like, family in the uh, uh, House of Wax kind of situation. You know, like uh, so. I thought it was great, though. I loved both of them. Um, I think uh, in both films, he really did a great job of taking comedic actors like Chris Hardwick's in that one, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. in this one in uh, 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 Cogs, uh, Walt, what is it, Walton Cogs? Is that his name? I forget. The, the, the other guy that plays the deputy. Yeah, I know. I'm drawing a blank as well. Yeah, he's he's he really is a hilarious actor though you know what i'm saying like he's his timing is he's really got some great comedy chops so that's one thing that that i think um the only other person that does it maybe is quentin tarantino of Mm -hmm. putting eclectic cast together of like here's some comedy people and here's straight up you know iconic drama people and with rob he put like straight up iconic horror people yeah uh, like sid and mosley and michael Behrman. And and then um, but then he put people like Brian Posehn and myself and uh, Priscilla Barnes, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, Reese Company, Leslie Easterbrook from Police Academy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like and but melded them together, let a little bit let us have a little, you know, especially my role as the, the deputy. I, I was able to be a little goofy, you know, a little light levity to the whole thing. And I'm going to get to that in a minute about why levity and comedy have to be in have they you need it in heart. And I'm mm-hmm. going to tell you why in a second. But ultimately, the two, the he he's able to mix those two really well and pull out and trust the comedic actors that I know you're a good drama a dramatic actor. You know what I mean? So I'm going to give you an opportunity. So that was pretty cool. And the one thing is, people always say like, oh, well, you know, um, you're a comedian by trade but i do all these horror movies and i was gonna say like i after studying horror movies and what they need is you do need that comedic levity that lets air out lets the tension and lets the helps you hit the reset button on something really gory and horrific it lets, it's, yeah. it's a quick way for the audience to reset so that they're ready for the next one because if you just keep it dramatic the whole time it doesn't let you lull back into a sense of a little more relaxation to then, you know, get the ghost jumps and stuff like that. The jumps, Absolutely. Scares, you know? So. Yeah. It had, it's a great balance and Rob does it really well. I mean, the really great filmmakers know how to balance that comedic levity you're talking about along with the serious right. jumps and the scares and the gore and whatnot. Dave, we are out of time. This has been a fascinating conversation Man, thank you are you. just a wealth of knowledge. And thank you so much for coming on our show and sharing with us. I look forward to meeting you in a couple of weeks in Atlantic yep. City. Uh, Great. Check out your movie as well. Any final thoughts you want to share? Um, if, you, if, you, if anybody out there is watching this Dead Talk Live and you see me, myself at a convention, come up and say hi and, and you know, Talk to me about the podcast and stuff like that because I'd like to hear from fans that, you know, and uh, hopefully you and I can do something maybe live. While we're there. The, with Felissa. We're going to be hosting the the um, film festival. Her oh, and I. So cool. maybe we can get a little interview with her. I, she's she's awesome. Has she been on the show yet? She has not been on the show yet. No, no. We're working on it. She needs to be. Yeah, for sure. She's always and, uh, busy. Like her manager says, she's always out producing something or acting she's a very very busy woman she is she is uh, uh that's why i'm uh, on my first film with her was victor crowley ah. that's right and we've done 28 movies since and uh wow. we just got done one up in connecticut called dark circles that she produced and most of those movies she's produced yeah she's a, so she's um, uh not only i mean she she's an extremely intelligent person uh, and she knows exactly when it comes to producing. I mean, she right. knows what she's doing. She does. She absolutely is. She's a veteran of the business. She's she's smart because she she learned by, while paying attention. You know what I mean? Yeah. First being an actor, paying attention on set, learning the business, and then taking over the business, it, so to speak. So, absolutely. Uh, You're 100% correct. In New Jersey, Arcon, 
Felicia will be there. I'll be there, and it'll be you know. Hopefully, I can see any fans come up and say hi. Yeah, exactly, guys. The New Jersey Horror Con and Film Horror Convention and Film Festival yep. is yep. going on November eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth. Uh, that weekend in Atlantic City. It's going to be a blast. The guest list is huge. I mean, yep. we're talking. There are going to be a lot of guests. Dave is going to be there. We're going to be covering. Felissa's going to be there. A lot of guests. A lot of great guests. So, if you're in the Atlantic City, New Jersey area, please come on over and check it out. I want to thank Dave Sheridan for being our guest. Thank you to our audience for tuning in tonight. David, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. On behalf of Dave and myself, stay safe and stay walking, everybody. Good night. Night, man. Bye.